years. Let's start going through bits and parts. Um, I call this the uh, the uh, tubes, the tubes and glands as well, the tubular system. So just like the male system is very tubular and easy to imagine that, I think, because you have the seminiferous tubules and the epididymis and the vas deferens, which seems very, very much like a tubular system. So is the female system. They're both based on the same anatomy. They just differentiate it into uh, different, you know, parts like you do. So ovaries first, the bilateral gonads, about an inch by two inches-ish, a little smaller than that. You remember seeing those in anatomy. They will try to have you fill them during um, the uh, gynecological exam. I was standing next to Professor Hughes when I did mine. We had a, a nurse that would come from um, t uh, Tulsa. And do, she did two sessions for our, our class, and we got to do exams on her. And she would say, okay, now palpate my ovaries. <laughs> Never felt it. I mean, I didn't. But she'd say, oh, there it was. Did you feel it? And I, all of it was so confusing to me. And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> she said, no, you didn't. Do it again. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but she knew. And what a glorious thing for patients to allow us to use their bodies. Um, you know, those standardized patients. And just, they're, it's amazing. So anyway. So the uh, ovary is not always so easy to find, I think. Tunica albigenia is that connective tissue covering on the outside of the ovary. The ovarian follicle is the business portion of the ovary. And for, when we talk about the ovary from here out, it's really the follicle and what happens with the follicle because the oocyte is developing within the follicle, and those are two different things, obviously. But the, uh, so the follicle develops, and it's burps the egg out for ovulation, and then we continue to follow what happens to that ovary throughout that cycle. So there's the follicular cycle or follicular phase of the whole cycle. And so the follicle is the big deal for the ovary, and it's where, you know, problems occur as well. There are follicle cells that will, that will convert into granulosa cells under the influence of hormones. Um, and so we will, we will learn all about those things. So follicles themselves can be given lots of names because they change throughout the phase. The hormones do this, and the follicles respond and change throughout time. So all the follicles that are sitting there at birth in the ovaries are such as they're going to be. And they are called primordial follicles, meaning they have that potential uh, for, for going into this follicular phase. Once they're stimulated to do so by something kind of miraculous and myster mysterical, is that a word, mysterical? Mysterious. Mysterial. Great word. If I can remember that, I'm in good shape. So, okay. Primary follicle then has, contains the oocyte and then two layers of granulosa cells. So, follicle cells will now be called granulosa cells because this is a follicle that will go um, through its phase. The secondary follicle will have begin to form these fluid filled spaces for the antrum, as it will be. And you'll see it along this um, particular diagram, which I use over and over and over is throughout this entire section is you see it coming around this way from birth to being completely spent and it doesn't move that way um, it's not a conveyor belt along the surface of the ovary um, but it just shows you this in this cartoon form so these fluid filled spaces you see in the secondary follicle will eventually coalesce to create a sphere of fluid around that oocyte and a vesicular follicle um, was more recently more commonly called a graphene follicle. But a vesicular follicle is the most mature. And you see it sitting here. So you have the oocyte on a stalk surrounded by cells and then a fluid-filled antrum or space. Uh, it's bulging from the surface. These can actually be seen. These will 
you, you know, be very close to the surface for sure because what you're going to do is spit that egg out and you want it to go out into space. Um, the, after the egg is gone, we continue the follicular cycle and convert the spent vesicular follicle into a corpus luteum. So that word luteum, you know before from luteinizing hormone and it comes from what LH does to the follicle, which is develop it through to become a corpus luteum. And so that refers to yellow um, color that you see. And eventually, it, w it becomes a little endocrine organ, and then eventually it will uh, fade away and degenerate and become a corpus albicans, or a, a scar, in a sense, really, at what was once a follicle. Along the duct system, then um, we start with uterine tube, tubes. I always want to call them oviducts. That's a very zoological term um, for human females. We say uterine tubes, also fallopian tube. You have heard more in the past. So all of these um, terms that we call it, uh, salpinx is singular, salpinges, um, plural, because they are bilateral. Extending nearby, really close to the vicinity of the ovary, but not um, not necessarily covering it. But you have, and I, I don't know why I put this isthmus at the bottom of this statement, but kind of coming from the uterus laterally, I said it extends medially from the uterus. I never noticed that, um, but it doesn't really. It's, it's away from the from the midline. Um, so you see that there is a uterine ostium, the word ostium or os um, is generic for opening or canal. And so you have an opening to the uterus and an opening at the other end for the egg. So it's the thing that conducts the egg to the uterus. The isthmus, ampulla, infundibulum then has all of the fimbriae on it. And it is movement of ciliated cells and also the fimbriae themselves that will help waft the egg, waft the egg toward the uh, ampulla. The os or uh, the, the, the interior of the, um, I wanted to say oviduct, uterine tube is quite narrow, um, but certainly big enough for an egg to pass. And then on the other side of this picture, you see that there's the mesosalpine, so that um, mesentery that's kind of covering the whole thing and keeping things suspended in space. The uterine tube has, it's almost impossible for me to call it a uterine tube, I want to say over that. But you have these layers, like you might suspect, a serosa and a subserosa, a mucosal layer, and then the mucosa itself, which would be on the lumen of that uh, salpinx. The muscular tissue is longitudinal and circular. So it will conduct, it will contract and help move the, have help with peristaltic movements. That's probably not so much for conducting the egg as it is for creating fluid waves. Um, because the egg is really so small, but it is really the uh, mucosa itself with, with these columnar cells and their cilia that will move the egg toward the uh, uterus. Two populations of cells along that mucosa or lining the lumen of the um, uh, uterine tube. Ciliated cells, most common. And let's go back and see this nice, just grassy kind of surface um, of the of this of that duct because it's so ciliated. Um, they create the wave. And then there are peg cells, which are granulated. They produce the tubular fluid. <coughs> and nutrients, so that the egg that would be going through is able to obtain nutrients. It does not have a blood supply. It won't have a blood supply until much later in the depths of the uterus. Never really a direct blood supply because it will then eventually come through if pregnancy occurs through that placenta. And so we have to surround that, that little lone egg with lots of cells that will produce nutrients for it or be a source of nutrients for that cell. 
And the peg cells in the uterine tubes will help do that. Estrogen, E is E is for estrogen. They never said that on Sesame Street. <laughs> E is for estrogen, increases those secretions. Progesterone, P, decreases those, those secretions. So E and P, that's estrogen, progesterone. And then there is a cross-section of the lumen of that tube, but it's very narrow. Uh, the, the full patency of that tube is more hair-like than anything else. Um, this is cadaveric, so it appears bigger. Um, and so, because it's such a narrow lumen, it won't take much inflammatory process to close that uterine tube. And so the ovaries alternate-ish, uh, pretty much, right, left, right, left, in ovulation monthly. And so if you have a blocked or a, a, in a, a uterine tube that is not patent, then you reduce the fertility chances 50% right up, right away. And so if there's an ovarian failure, you also reduce 50%. If both ovaries are failing, then you see it's very easy to reduce female fertility because of the duct work. And so this is why we're so concerned about sexually transmitted <coughs> infections, often disease in female, maybe not even showing up as an infection in males. And so <clears throat> what I want you to do in your practice is appreciate the fact that nothing goes on in this body that isn't influenced by a body that has sex with it. And so, uh, and all that that implies, <laughs> and vice versa. But I, I really encourage you to talk to your male patients like you would with your female patients about reproductive Things. You're going to ask every female patient this first day, and I, just, I probably said this during the during the male section, but yes, you're going to ask every female patient of childbearing age, what well, was the first day of your last period, could you be pregnant? What if we focused an equal amount of attention in male reproduction? I think it would be good for everybody. And just say, are you happy with your uh, uh, child? birth control method. How are you preventing sexually transmitted diseases? Because I do think there's this idea that women take the pill, that's covered. But it is such a small part of the story. A pregnancy is so small and in the list of things that can happen. It's an impact, to be sure. But you know, so if someone's on the pill, you're still not decreasing sexually transmitted diseases. And so you find what works for you, how you're going to say it, but what if we started looking at reproductive medicine as equal between men and women. And why not try that? And, and men, I don't think we talk to men about their sexuality very much. I mean, it's kind of a joke, right? I mean, you know what I mean? Um, that it's, it's just supposed to happen, it's supposed to work, or whatever, and you learned all about ED and all of that stuff. But what if we just said, yeah, you know what, you're that other half of pregnancy, and sexually transmitted diseases. So what are you doing to take care of you in that? And that takes care of your partner. So anyway. And obviously that's really the same if those those partners are same gender or not. You know, reproductive health is not just about reproducing. So anyway. So there it is. Oh, there's the uterus. Were you impressed with the uterus during No. <laughs> I wasn't. I was so upset. It's so, was like this big. Uh, exactly. <laughs> this big. Raise your fists. I know, but that's what was so impressive about it, right? So you look at this little this little cadaver. She's 82 years old or whatever, and there's this teeny little deal, and you look, and she had four babies, and that thing just boom. So it's a remarkable tissue. You know, it's a remarkable tissue that that thing goes back. And so what we know about it is that the lumen of it is very small and it's quite muscular. It, and those muscles can certainly stretch and the, and the interior of that vesicle can get very big. Um, but miraculously, it goes down so small. 
um, thick pear shaped, um, very muscular anterior to the rectum. So just you know, look at this little this little picture. I love this. It's just you know, the uterus can be in a lot of positions along the way and be and be really normal and functional, but it's a uh, 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 superior and anterior to the rectum and um, uh, posterior to the bladder. And so when you see that, you can see why a bimanual exam works really well. You, you can use the, uh, the uh, vaginal canal to do a, um, uh, an exam or palpation, but you can also palpate from the rectum and get that rear portion of that uterine exam. And so you see why that's an important and complete part of a pelvic exam. Do let them know before you do that. Um, and so there, and these are uh, different positionings that you can find the, um, the, the uh, uterus in regions. The fundus is the top. There's the whole body of the, uh, of the uterus. The cervical canal, so cervi cervical refers to neck, and so that's just the neck of the uterus itself. And then there's an os or canal uh, along the cervix. And so there's the internal portion of that os, which is at the uterine side, and then the uh, external os, which is at the vaginal side, and that's what you're visualizing during the speculum exam. And so, you know, I think you educate your parent, your patients, not your parents, I almost said that, they know. <laughs> educate your patients that you're just going to observe the cervix and take a, a small sample of cells from that, and that be, is called the pap smear. Um, and so, uh, it's some, I think it's good for them to know. So that os is informative about information. And throughout the cycle, the changes happen um, as cell, the cell, the, the kind of the um, the milieu of cells change throughout the cycle that you're taking from that cervix. The uterus. So, looking at the wall of the uterus, you can see. Okay, look at this lower one. That's a, a cross section across the entire uterus. Look, look at this. This is a transverse. Myometrium is the muscle layer, and so then we have the um, endometrium, and it changes every month from thinning to thickening, and then thinning again, and sloughing. And so you have two layers of this endometrium. A functional layer, which is going to be uh, at the luminal surface, and then this basal layer, stratum basalis, which will always be there, never change, and give rise to that functional layer throughout the cycle. So it's the functionalis that changes cyclically or cyclically, cyclically, um, mysterically, <laughs> and then it's shed every 28-ish days. So the blood supply to the uterus is a big deal because that egg itself will never have a direct blood supply. There is no direct connection between maternal and, and fetal um, blood, but we're way back here at just zygote or egg getting there, really just egg getting there. And so we have to have a nice, comfy, bloody surface for that egg to be in so that it can receive plenty of nutrients for this wild growth. And so the uterus is fed from the uterine uh, artery off of the internal iliac. You recall those. Um, do, you, do, you, do you remember that artery that extends from the heart into the, into the torso? Aorta. Yes, the aorta. <laughs> Abdominal aorta. Good. So that's where we're getting blood from the heart. We want to keep it connected. Um, and so then you have spinoffs from the uterine ar uh, arteries that feed the, um, the uterine tissue, the arcuate arteries. Uh, did you probably dissected those and had to name those? I don't, I don't remember personally if we did that. Arcuate. Um, 
but those then give rise into radial branches, which gives rise to straight arteries, which you find in the basal layer. Those radial branches will also give rise to spiral arteries, and they are so named because they have a helical kind of appearance. And those will be found in extending into the functional layer. The edges of those will actually crinkle up and die. And so you see the result of that as bloody shed from the uterus monthly. Bloody shed. Work that into a conversation. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of deer on our come into a feeder on our property, and so we've got these big bucks. We call them the Buck Brothers. And I'm fascinated by antlers. Always have been. I mean, they're so they're covered with velvet right now. They're highly vascular and they're growing. And I'm just like waiting to find shed on the property. So I'm, that's where the word shed is coming from. To me. No longer. No, I'm not gonna say. It. <laughs> Uh, so what is amazing is that whole functionalist layer is being built and all this vasculature is being built so you can feed and nurture an egg and then a zygote and then um, somewhere along the way until there's a placenta which would be completed about three months of a pregnancy. So it is really this uterine wall that will feed that growing thing. And so should there be one. So that is just, it's just, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to build every month. I look, I look at the, um, the, I really, I look at these antlers. So antlers are, see, are male only horns or male and female. So antlers are growing and you think every year all the energy, I think about all that energy that that body is making to grow this big old wreck and how cool that must feel to have it, you know? <laughs> and then it goes away and all of a sudden, you know, they're like running through the woods and all of a sudden they can get through things. So I don't know, I spend a lot of time thinking about it. <laughs> but it's really the same for a female body that you're just, you're growing that uterus, but not once a year, not seasonally, but monthly. And aren't they really the same things, the seasonal reproductive kind of thing? And for females, it's, it's monthly. So it's just, I don't know, just this is a circle of life. I just worked the uterine lining into a lecture about antler growth. Thank you very much. <laughs> There are also uterine glands, so you see one here. Here's a good picture of the uh, arcuate arteries giving rise to the radial arteries, giving rise to spiral and um, straight arteries there. Straight arteries in the basal layer, and then these, these um, spiral up into the functionalis. But additionally, you have these uterine glands, which will be making a uh, secreting a glycogen-rich secretion. Glycogen is glucose, and so, uh, I mean, we're just coming at we're coming at that egg in every possible way. The body really attempts to create that nourishing um, atmosphere for the egg. The uterine gland secretion is and, and amplification is enhanced by progesterone, which really makes sense. So progesterone is that pregnancy of hormone, uh, hormone of pregnancy, and so it's really the one that helps to maintain a pregnancy. So should you have a fertilized egg show up, you're ready. And then progesterone will make sure that this uterine lining is maintained so that you don't slough it off. The vagina. A thin walled muscular tube thrown into rugal folds um, between the bladder and the rectum. And it really exists from the cervix to the interior. Their exterior, there would be a little pocket of, of vagina or vaginal vault behind, <clears throat> behind the, um, where the, the, you see the uterus extending into the vaginal canal. The fornix is that kind of blind sac at the end of, um, or blind fundus, really, at the end of the, the vaginal wall. 
And here is your view of vaginal folds, really, through a speculum. And so you can kind of see those folds. And that makes sense because this thing is going, it's a vagina one day. But at some point, it could be a birth canal, or what we call a birth canal. So it should, should be able to open quite a bit, like to pass a human. Amazing. The, um, the uh, vaginal layers themselves, so adventitia is inner, or innermost, and so connective tissue, the vaginal wall uh, to the lumen of the dill. Muscularis layer, it's, it's thin. Um, the mucosa itself then is, has the rugal folds. Stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified squamous epithelium is also found as skin. And so it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, you know, epithelial arrangement where flat cells are next to each other. And so you have a lot of tensile strengths. And that is a, that's a, a tissue that could take a beating. Oh, God. It just, it has a lot can happen. A baby could pass through there. Certainly fertilization, the site of fertilization. I'm moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. I guess I just mean to say that's the epithelial tissue that's really going to be quite tough for what the, um, for, for the function of that vehicle. Um, and so there are no mucus glands. I think that's always a bit interesting. So any kind of lubrication that's going to come to the uh, vaginal area will be provided by other places. So the cervix is one place that will secrete mucus. And then also exterior, exterior mucus glands that will be found in the labia. So for example, Bartholin glands. There are also the epithelial glands contain glycogen granules. Vaginal normal flora, normal flora is there, so the skin, the colon, vaginal canal has normal flora and tends to um, be uh, cells that will produce lactic acid and tend to keep that um, acidity or keep that that as kind of a harsh acidic environment so low pH and that is antibacterial it's also a spermicide um, and so seminal fluid works against that by being quite alkaline to help neutralize that acidity it acts as an acid mantle um, so that you have, uh, and you can keep an environment that's healthy. The hymen would be an external partition that would partition, uh, partially cover the introitus or opening to the um, vaginal canal, which you may, um, you may visualize in an early uh, pelvic exam. However, you really necessarily might not Right now, um, the gynecology is recommending that a woman has a first um, exam at sexual activity uh, and or 18, whichever I guess comes first, something like that. So you may never really visualize a high menu may. So here's just sort of the external view. None of that is vagina. Mommy has a vagina, Daddy has a penis. I don't know. It's just that bothers me. So you have the mons pubis, which is just really this external um, uh, area covered with pubic hair. Labia majora, outer um, labia, the inner labia minora. The vestibule then is the space that's really from, uh, it's what's contained kind of within that labia minora. So from where the um, uh, urethral, uh, uh, what am I trying, meatus is to the very base of the introitus. They, there are two Bartholin's glands know if you, I don't remember necessarily seeing those during my, my anatomy class. Um, bilateral, bilateral glands kind of near the, um, the base of that vestibule. Clitoris, analogous to a penis, um, erectile tissue, hood, kind of hooded by skin. 
And then the perineum or the um, pelvic floor, the muscular floor, just to remind you what muscles you see there. Uh, perineum, coccygeus, the vader cani. Just to remind you because you'll be hearing a lot about the pelvic floor as you go along. Um, other girl bits, mammary glands, modified sweat glands, anterior to pectoral muscles, fatty tissue, areola on the outside, we'll get to nipple later, but on the inside you have these lobes of the mammary gland that are uh, septated into sections. There are lobules, which are milk producing glands. Um, the alveoli, glandular alveoli located within that will produce milk. Those coalesce to form lactiferous ducts, which will open via the nipple. Uh oh, Genesis. Female gamete production. Different than spermatogenesis. Remember, spermatogenesis was about numbers. Constitutive throughout life, produce for every one diploid cell that enters meiosis, four sperm should be produced. Here, you want to, you don't want to shunt any cellular material away. You want to make a big fat egg that's full of everything for the, for the possibility of fertilization. And so you shunt away just the extra DNA as polar bodies. So you start out with an oogonium there in the uh, ovarian tissue. And so the follicle and the oocyte have um, different developments that have a kind of coincide. And so here's the thing with the whole why female reproduction seems a little more complicated is that you have three sites that stuff is going on. One is the ovary, the other is the uterus, and the other is the breast tissue. So within the ovary, you then have a subset of the egg is developing and then the follicle is developing. So it's multi-layered. And so oogenesis you see going along here, follicle development over there to kind of just show you what's where. So you have that primordial follicle, which is the follicle with the potential um, to develop. And there is the primary oocyte in that arrested at prophase one. That's at birth. All the eggs that will ever be produced are there at birth. Females are born with them. And so that gives new meaning to advanced maternal age. Because by the time somebody is 40, those same eggs have been sitting there for 40 years since birth, subject to all the things that could have happened, from radiation to chemicals that were ingested. So, that's why a, a maternal age is such a big deal. Um, and so at, at birth, uh, everybody's in prophase one. So meiosis was divided into, uh, into meiosis one and meiosis two. And so for spermatogenesis, that's happening all the time. Like every 21 days, uh, you have reached that full development. But here, it could be full development to um, the end of meiosis II doesn't even happen until that egg is fertilized. So when um, a woman undergoes menstruation, you are, it's, it's a, a, an egg that's in meiosis II but not, has not completed it. So there is this great reserve to complete meiosis in the female oocyte. And it won't even, it's like I'm not even, I'm not even going there until there's a sperm. And so it's just kind of an interesting strategy that you create this big egg that's really, it, it, it helps to preserve DNA, probably, it would be the reason for that. So, um, the oogonium is the fetal, in the fetal ovary and develops then monthly, mir mir miraculously, mysterically, um, <laughs> into primary oocytes that, uh, will be halted at prophase one. Or that doesn't really seem right. You're born there. So it's under the, under the, am I going back? Oh, I'm not to the next slide yet. Uh, and so it's really going to be monthly that you continue to develop the secondary oocyte. So look here in the primary, the growing follicle will be stimulated to get that oocyte to go from uh, primary to secondary or to enter into meiosis again. So next 
slide then is going from, to the secondary oocytes. So this is under the influence of hormones entering meiosis two and then halting at, my, at metaphase two. At this time, you have um, this. All of the cell material is is being contained into the one big cell. So what happens is two things can happen. No sperm. That thing will just degenerate and be sloughed out. Uh, but if there's sperm penetration, then fertilization can occur, but only after meiosis II completes. So fertilization is really on pause. The sperm gets there, his DNA enters as a nucleus and sits in the cytoplasm while meiosis II uh, continues. So you go through uh, anaphase and telophase and then fertilization. So it's just, it's just, it's just beautifully preserved. And so what happens with that is the egg is gone from the follicle, of course, so that it can interact with sperm over there in the uterine tube. Uh, and so the corpus or the, the, the follicle continues without its, without its uh, egg. 500 oocytes in about 45 years of fertility. I shouldn't say, you really shouldn't say fertility necessarily, but during reproductive years. 500. <clears throat> this is the best diagram. So this is showing the uterine cycle. <clears throat> so you had three sites of development monthly. Um, uh, ovary, uterus, mammary glands. This is only showing um, pelvic area. So you have the ovarian cycle up there showing what's going on in the ovary. And the uterine cycle here showing what's going on with the uterus. And so we're fairly unaware of the ovarian cycle as you go along. But the uterine cycle you know because that uterus is building up and sloughing off and building up and sloughing off. So look at menses here at the end of the cycle. Menses is what's starting the cycle. And so with regard to that ovarian cycle, you have three kind of distinct phases. One is the follicular phase. And it's showing, it's naming that down here where you can see what's happening with the uterus. So while the follicle is developing, the uterus is sloughing the endometrium and beginning to build the endometrium back up. So the endometrium is beginning to be built up uh, and then ovulation occurs. So the uh, ovary has the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. And so the uterus, there's ovulation, that's not the same as fertilization. Fertilization is going to happen along that route to the uterus. So by the time a fertilized egg would appear in the uterus, it's going to be a full week after ovulation or later. And then you've got this nice thick uterine lining ready for the, um, for the approach of that egg. Should that egg not be fertilized, the whole thing breaks down and appears as menses again. So I'll keep showing you this. But it's it's the way to how to learn it's the way to how to learn the whole cycle, and so you you prepare the ovary to get rid of an egg, and you prepare the uterus to receive that egg. That just that's what makes sense, and so the hormones are directing that. Here's body temperature there, it peaks at ovulation. You know that. I think there's an app for that. Um, and look at hormones. So if, if you don't even look at any of the names of hormones, you see them just, there's just waves of hormones. We know that. But look at how you get this peak of three hormones at ovulation. That's significant. LH and FSH, the gonadotropins from the anterior pituitary. You see estrogen peaking just before that. And look at progesterone absolutely follows the curve of that uterine thickening. I think uh, if you if you just if you know this, you'll you know all of it. And you can always just draw a little picture of that to remind yourself. That's what I always did. You know, of course you have a computer, but you have notebook paper too. So anyway, 
I'm going to keep coming back to that. We're going to look at the ovarian part of that cycle. So there's the ovarian cycle, the uterine cycle, and um, the uh, uh, mammary cycle really as well because mammary glands also build up and then decrease. So first, let's just look at the follicle. We're going to build the follicle and continue to develop and get rid of an egg. But the follicular cycle goes on. Uh, or the ovarian cycle goes on. So first, the follicular phase. So here's the little picture, again, to show you. Here are the days from 1 to 28, which would be an average cycle. And it's really, you'll have people that have three-week and five-week cycles as well, as long as they're consistent. It's really all the same things that are happening. Um, Primordial follicle becomes a primary follicle. Primary follicle becomes a secondary follicle during this stage. And what's happening is the follicle cells, so you had a follicle and an oocyte. So now we want to develop that. So the first thing that happens is these follicular cells that are forming this follicle are going to proliferate and mature. We're now going to call them granulosa cells, and there'll be two layers of them around the oocyte. So what's really going to happen is lots of layers are going to form. We have to form a layer of follicular cells on the outside of that follicle. The inside is the oocyte, and we're going to have a layer of cells around that as well. And so there are fecal cells that will form that layer around the follicle itself. And then those, those layers will go on with the egg. So that makes sense. We're going to grow this follicle, but we're going to spit this egg out at some point. So we need to have zones of cells around it to protect it. You don't want a bare naked egg out there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you want a, a zone of cells around it, and that's what happens. So those will be the fecal cells, and then there are the granulosa cells. And so uh, we call that, I'm sorry, I said fecal. Fecal is the follicular side that are really going to, I'm sorry, wait, hold on. The follicle cells become granulosa cells, and we call that the theca. And then around the egg itself is a zona pellucida. Mm -hmm. And LH will begin to be um, um, sent from the brain to have its influence on the gonads. And what will happen to that oocyte is that it will begin meiosis, or it will resume meiosis. The oocyte is now becoming a secondary um, follicle. Oocyte becomes a secondary oocyte. So I'm confusing oocyte and follicle. So let me start. Let's stop and go to the next picture. Secondary follicle is now going to become a vesicular or graphene follicle, meaning all along this whole way you have these, these granulosa cells that are forming the theca are going to be secreting solution that will cause a big swelling of fluid within this sphere. And so you see that. The antrum is fluid filled. You see the ovum with its zona pellucida a corona radiata forms, and that will all be surrounding that egg when it gets ovulated. So there's kind of a little stalk of cells surrounding that, that kind of projecting that ovum into the middle of the oocyte, into the middle of that antrum. So that is filling with fluid and becoming more and more tense. The point of the follicle is to expand and grow. The egg is developing along the way, and this is under the influence of LH. LH is going to inspire that egg to do all of its stuff, as well as FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. In time, that tension becomes so high, and you can watch, um, maybe, maybe you'll see this during lectures, I don't know, but you can see with the actual imagery of the um, egg being just shot out like a, a rocket.
when that ruptures. It's just, it's amazing and kind of, it seems violent. And it's such that it even can be felt by some uh, women as metal shrimps, uh, follicular ovulation. Um, and so the wall ruptures, and so that egg is released. So here's the egg itself with the nucleus, the cytoplasm, a zone of pellucidus surrounding that oocyte itself, corona radiata around it, and that's out there being wafted toward the uterine tube by ciliated cells of the fimbriae. But meanwhile, the rest of that follicle isn't done. The follicle then, this is so lovely. First it was, a, it was housing an egg and growing, it was a little incubator for the egg. And now it's going to become a little endocrine gland that will say the egg is out there. Just simmer down. Everybody simmer down. Just build up that uterus. We have sent an egg out. And so this spent follicle becomes a corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is sending out a flare. It's going to send out a hormone to say an egg is out there. And it's just, the, it's just so, it's, it's just adorable, really, when you think about it. Post ovulation, the granulosa and fecal cells become the corpus luteum, which are very fat filled cells because they're going to be making hormones. And so um, it's called the corpus luteum as a result of that. The antrum of that will fill with the blood clot. You get this conversion to corpus luteum, and progesterone will be secreted also, some estrogen. Progesterone is secreted by the corpus luteum. The other thing that will produce progesterone would be a placenta. Well, that's not there, nor will it be finished for months. So it is the ovary itself that is um, maintaining that uterine wall. So the uterus wall got built up, and progesterone will say, okay, don't have, we don't want uterine contractions. We want to have a nice, closed, quiet cervix, so it'll thicken the mucus of the cervix, and just give that egg a chance. And so the corpus luteum is doing that. Now, without some kind of signal that there is a fertilized egg there, then the corpus luteum just degenerates, and we just start the whole process again. Ah, uh, lose that egg, start again next time. And so then the corpus luteum is called an albicans. If there is a, a pregnancy, corpus luteum will persist and keep producing progesterone until the pregnancy is at a stage that that's not nearly enough. And so you have the placenta taking that over. It's just adorable. It's like a plant. So here are just pictures again, the same thing to show you the development along the way. Secondary follicle to vesicular follicle, ovulated follicle, and corpus luteum. The ovarian cycle. So you have the follicular phase, then ovulation, then the luteal phase. Hormonal regulation of the ovarian phase. Oh, let's take a little, little breaky break. Let's take a little break. Yeah. Yeah.